Niagara Parks Commission. Niagara Falls, Canada, became a major tourist attraction in the mid 1830s. By this time, roads, canals, and railways were able to bring people from urban centers like New York and Boston. However, the chance for big profits attracted dishonest businessmen. One hotel in the 1860s was popularly known as the Cave of the Forty Thieves. There were many complaints from tourists about tricks that were used to get their money. Some businessmen tried to put up fences around the falls so that all visitors would have to pay them to see the falls. In time, these complaints reached the ears of important people. In 1873, Lord Dufferin, the Governor General of Canada, proposed that the government buy all the land around the falls. On the American side, New York State bought 412 acres around the American Rainbow Falls in 1885. In the same year, land was bought near the Canadian Horseshoe Falls and named Queen Victoria Park. A commission was formed to obtain control of all land along the Niagara River. This was made easier because a narrow strip along the river was already government land. However, the commission wanted to preserve all the beautiful scenery along the river and near the falls for the general public. The first commissioner of the park was Sir Kazimierz Gzowski, a distinguished engineer of Polish birth. Before the Queen Victoria Park Commission began to buy up land besides the falls, tourists had to pay for everything. There were no public washrooms, no drinking fountains, and no safety barriers around the falls. As a result, it was not uncommon for tourists crowding close to the falls or hypnotized by the flow of the river to step too close and fall in. The commission took care of these problems and also set up parks and picnic areas. In 1927, the commission's name was changed to the Niagara Parks Commission. It now supervises numerous attractions and parks from Niagara on the Lake on Lake Ontario down to Fort Erie on Lake Erie. Each section of the 56-kilometer stretch of Niagara Parks has its own places of interest. These are joined by the Niagara Parkway, a road that runs the whole length of the river. Sir Winston Churchill called the parkway the prettiest Sunday afternoon drive in the world. The Niagara Parks Commission operates restaurants, parks and gardens, rides, museums, and historic houses, golf courses, native sites, and gift shops. Near the falls are restaurants, parks, greenhouses, the journey behind the falls, and the Maid of the Mist boat ride. North of the falls at Niagara Gorge are the Spanish Arrow car ride and the Great Gorge Adventure. The commission also operates a school of horticulture with large gardens. Queenston Heights is a park commemorating one of Canada's heroes, General Isaac Brock. In nearby Queenston are historic houses connected with two other important Canadians, Laura Secord and William Lyne Mackenzie. The commission also operates two historic forts dating from the War of 1812, Fort George and Old Fort Erie. The Niagara Parks Commission has played a major role in making Niagara Falls and the Niagara River. One of the leading tourist areas in the world. The commission shows how governments can work to make visits to natural wonders like Niagara Falls a good experience for the general public. The Welland Canal. Before railways and automobiles became common, transporting goods over long distances was a difficult chore. In early North America, roads were often bad or non-existent. In the winter, snow and cold weather made travel difficult. Frontier farmers had trouble selling their crops because it was hard to get them to the cities. Often, rivers and lakes were the best ways to travel. Fur traders carried their furs and other supplies in canoes, but even large canoes were not big enough to hold a shipment of wheat. Rapids and waterfalls meant that goods had to be taken out of the canoe and carried to the next body of calm water. One way to improve water transportation was to build a canal. In New York State, Governor DeWitt Clinton had constructed the Erie Canal from the Niagara River to the Hudson River soon after the War of 1812. Because relations between the United States and Canada were still not very friendly, this was another reason to build a canal on the Canadian side. Canals could be used to move supplies and troops during wartime. Sometimes the British government would forbid Canadian farmers to sell food to the USA. Without a canal to move their farm produce, crops were sometimes left to rot. A Saint Catharines, Ontario merchant named William Hamilton Merritt. Thought about all these things in the 1820s. He also thought that flour mills needed a more reliable source of water to operate. 
St. Catharines is on 12 Mile Creek below the Niagara Escarpment. This creek runs towards Lake Ontario. It rises above the escarpment, which stands from 150 to 300 feet high, then runs towards Lake Ontario. If Merritt could join the 12 Mile Creek to one of the rivers, which ran to Lake Erie, the canal would provide transportation and water power. The problem was to find a way to move boats up the escarpment. From 1824 to 1829, Merritt and his friends hired laborers to dig away tons of dirt and rock. Nearly all the work was done with shovels, pickaxes, horses, and wagons. In places, the ground was soft and landslides occurred. In other places, the men had to dig through solid granite rock. Merritt's main problem, however, was raising the money to pay for the construction. After sinking all the money that he, his family, and friends had into the canal, more was needed. Merritt went to Toronto, New York, and finally London, England to get the financial support he needed. The problem of getting the boats to climb the escarpment was solved by a series of 35 wooden locks. These carried a ship 327 feet upwards. The ship would enter a lock with a small amount of water. More water would come into the lock, lifting the boat another 10 or 15 feet. Then the ship would move into the next lock and be lifted up again. Boats going in the opposite direction were lowered instead of lifted. The Welland Canal has been rebuilt three times since the first canal opened in 1829. Now large seagoing and lake vessels cross the Niagara Peninsula from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. They carry grain, coal, iron ore, oil, and many other bulk products. The Welland Canal remains one of the most important commercial waterways in the world. Walmart Stores Walmart is now the world's largest retail organization. Walmart employs around 1.2 million people worldwide. In 2000, Walmart had sales of more than $191 billion with profits of $6.3 billion. Profits increased 16% from the previous year. People have come to expect that Walmart's profits will increase substantially every year. Each year, more stores are opened and Walmart expands into new countries. Walmart also enters new areas of business nearly every year. Few people know that Walmart is also a major real estate company. Sam Walton opened his Walton's Five and Dime in Bentonville, Arkansas in 1950. Twelve years later, he opened the first Walmart in Bentonville. His business philosophy was simple, good prices, great selection, and a friendly greeting. Walton was known for the 10-foot attitude. This means that any employee should greet any customer who is within 10 feet of them. He emphasized that it is important to speak to people before they speak to you. Walton also believed that good deals from suppliers should be passed along to customers. The combination of low prices and friendly service is basic to Walmart's success. That one store in Bentonville has become 4,203 stores in the USA, plus another 1,000 outside the United States. Walton died in 1992, but his business philosophy continues to be preached at Walmarts. Each store has greeters who meet the customers at the door and deal with any special needs they have. Having greeters gives the effect of having more service clerks than Walmart really has. Compared to some other department stores, Walmart has relatively fewer employees. Walmart also has the Walmart Foundation, which sponsors numerous good causes. Among their programs are high school scholarships, fundraising for local hospitals and sick children, environmental concerns, and community matching grant outreach. So what's not to like about Walmart? The main complaint is that their business style is extremely aggressive. Walmart's attitudes towards manufacturers and suppliers are, you do it our way or we won't do business with you. This puts Walmart at an advantage over smaller retails who don't have the same retailing power. Walmart has been known to demand that its suppliers provide products at discount for Walmart store openings, levy fines for shipment errors, tell manufacturers what products, styles, and colors to make, etc. 
Walmart expects product delivery in two days and expects manufacturers to cooperate with its promotional and retailing strategies. In effect, any company that works with Walmart becomes one of their employees. Any company which so dominates one area of the market will have a lot of power. So far, Walmart has been successful in getting what it wants and providing customers with what they want. The Ford Pinto case. Businessmen often complain that their profits are negatively affected by government regulations. On the other hand, history has proven that it is necessary to regulate business in at least one area. Public safety. There is ample evidence that consideration for the safety of the public is not always a priority in business decisions. Back in 1912, the Titanic smashed into an iceberg, killing hundreds of people. It was going too fast through a large collection of icebergs while attempting to set a speed record. Unfortunately, there were not enough lifeboats to accommodate the passengers. Usually, when such a tragedy occurs, the company is not found guilty. Instead, safety regulations are enacted for future cases. In the future, ships were ordered to carry a sufficient supply of lifeboats. In 1978, the Ford Motor Company was indicted on the charge of homicide. This was the first time such a charge had been brought against an American corporation. It related to the deaths of three teenage girls who were burned up when their Ford Pinto was hit from behind. The prosecution charged that the Ford company knowingly manufactured a dangerous car. Behind this story is the pressure on Ford to produce a small car to compete with imported vehicles. The Pinto was rushed into production in spite of warnings that the gas tank was in a dangerous position. It would have cost Ford an additional eleven dollars per car to fix the problem. Ford decided not to. Later, Ford produced a cost-benefit analysis to justify their position, estimating that the faulty design would cause 180 additional deaths. Ford valued these at $200,000 per person. This cost was far less than equipping 12.5 million vehicles with $11 protectors. So Ford felt that they had made the right decision. Ford executives were acquitted on the charge of homicide. Nonetheless, Ford had to pay out millions of dollars in out-of-court settlements. These were paid to families who had lost relatives in Pinto accidents. This case shows how far a company will go to protect its profits. For more than eight years, Ford lobbied the government not to tighten safety standards on cars. As long as the Pinto was profitable, Ford did not want to change the design. Although Ford made a lot of money on the Pinto, their reputation was tarnished. The Ford Pinto case is one of many which point to the need for governments to set safety standards. No business wants to recall its products or leave them sitting idly in a warehouse or expend large sums of money for upgrading and repairs. No airplane company wants to have its planes in the hangar when they could be in the air making money for the corporation. As a result, commercial companies are seldom motivated to look closely at product or service safety. This is especially true today, when the bottom line in business is seen as a justification for every decision. For this reason, governments have to oversee issues of public safety. Most businesses are too busy working on profits to have much time or concern for doing so. The Golden Man, El Dorado. When Christopher Columbus sailed west from Spain in 1492, he was trying to reach the Spice Islands, which today are called Indonesia. Spices were very scarce and valuable in Europe at this time. No one knew that two vast oceans and the American continents lay between Europe and Asia. Columbus did not find spices in America, but he did bring home some gold trinkets. The American Indians wore these as jewelry. Gold, not spices, was to become the biggest motive for exploration. Expeditions into the interior of the Americas were very costly and very risky. Only by promising the authorities huge profits could sailors and soldiers raise money for their expeditions. They also needed to promise rich rewards in order to get followers and crews. If a leader returned to Europe without gold and jewels, he might end up in jail. No wonder the Spanish conquerors were always searching for gold. 
At first, the Spaniards stayed around the coasts of the Caribbean Sea, but stories of gold in the interior tempted them to explore inland. They asked the Indians where their gold jewelry came from. The Indians would point further inland. They said that a wealthy people lived in the high mountains that traded gold and emeralds for pearls, cotton, and shells. The Spanish emperor had given the rights to exploit present-day Venezuela and Colombia to his German bankers in 1528. So Germans Dalfinger, Featherman, and Hohermuth led a series of expeditions into the jungles, grasslands, and mountains. Meanwhile, Spanish conquerors had found immense riches in gold and silver. Hernando Cortez had captured the kingdom of the Aztecs in Mexico in 1519. He had sent immense treasures to Europe. Soon after this, Francisco Pizarro began to explore the west coast of South America. In 1531, Pizarro invaded Peru and destroyed the kingdom of the Incas. Pizarro melted down the gold and silver treasures of the Incas and sent gold and silver bricks back to Spain. The rush to find more gold became very heated. Rumors came down from the mountains of Colombia about a golden man, El Hombre Dorado. There were stories about a king so rich that he wore gold dust instead of a coat. Colombia was the kingdom of the Chipchas. They were a trading people who traded salt and emeralds for gold, cotton, pearls, and shells. The actual gold did not come from their kingdom. It was found in the mountain rivers and brought to the Chipchas for refining and metalwork. Several armies converged on Chipcha territory. The first to arrive was the Spaniard Quesada, coming up the Magdalena River from the Caribbean. He found the chief cities of the Chipchas and seized their gold and emeralds. Shortly afterwards, one of Pizarro's captains arrived from Peru and Ecuador. Then the German Federman arrived from Venezuela. Quesada gave the latecomers some gold and jewels to ease their disappointment. Casada's men also found out about the Golden Man. High in the mountains was a lake created by a meteorite. The Indians believed that the Golden God from the sky now lived at the bottom of the lake. When a new leader of the tribe was elected, he was covered in grease, and fine gold dust was blown over his body so that he appeared to be made of gold. He was taken out to the middle of the lake on a raft. He would jump into the lake and stay in the water till the gold dust was washed off. It was considered an offering to the god. Gold ornaments were also tossed in the lake. Then the king and his followers would return to the shore. The ceremony was stopped several generations before the Europeans arrived. Many people were unwilling to believe that this was the whole story. They began to search for a golden city hidden in the jungle. Many explorers perished in this search. In their search for gold, the Spanish conquerors destroyed the great Indian civilizations of America. Towns and villages had been ruined. Thousands of people killed, and wonderful pieces of art melted down. Some Indians believed that gold must be a food that Europeans desperately needed to stay alive. In many cases, the Europeans destroyed the trading and social systems that had produced their wealth. When we think about the great achievements of a few conquerors and explorers, we are also sad about how much death and damage they caused. The Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is one of the most spectacular sights in nature. It is found in one section of the valley of the Colorado River. The river begins its course high in the Rocky Mountains of the state of Colorado. The river travels a total of 1,400 miles through Colorado, Utah, and Arizona, and into the Gulf of California. It forms part of Arizona's border with Nevada and California. The Colorado River is a very swift and muddy river. It carries dirt and rocks down from the mountains. The story is told of an old fur trader who was attacked by Indians high up the river. His only escape was down the Colorado River in a small boat. It was a terrifying trip through rapids and around rocks at top speed. The fur trader was found some days later in very rough shape, hundreds of miles down the river. No one would believe that he had come so far so fast. The Grand Canyon stretches for about 250 miles in the state of Arizona. The canyon was carved out by the flow of the river itself. In places, the canyon is more than a mile deep. It stretches from four to 18 miles wide at the top. The canyon valley contains worn rocks that rise up like a mountain range. The canyon has been worn down through many layers of rock. The river has cut its way down through layers of sandstone, limestone, and shaped to the granite bedrock. The 
The different layers are of different colors, and the rocks appear very beautiful, especially at sunrise and sunset. Because the canyon is so deep, the climate changes as you go down into the valley. At the top, the climate is typical of a mountain area with evergreen trees. Next, you have typical forest trees. Third, there are plants like cacti that grow in warm deserts. Finally, there are subtropical plants at the valley bottom. Tourists can ride down the narrow trails to the bottom of the valley on mules. On one side is the rock wall of the canyon, and on the other side is a steep drop down to the bottom. Tourists have to trust their guide and the mule that they are riding to get them down safely. The trails zigzag back and forth, and the tourist going down travels much more than a mile. Some 1,000 square miles of the area became the Grand Canyon National Park in 1919. Because the Colorado River is very swift and runs through dry country, several dams have been built along it. These are designed to harness its power, save its water, and provide recreational opportunities. The best known dam is Hoover Dam, formerly Boulder Dam, on the Arizona-Nevada border. This impressive structure is 727 feet high and 1,282 feet long. Elevators are used to carry workers up and down inside the dam. The water, which is backed up by the Hoover Dam, forms Lake Mead. Lake Mead is used to irrigate nearby land as well as for boating and fishing. The dam itself is a major source of electric power for this section of the country. Visitors to the Grand Canyon are often filled with awe by the size and beauty of the canyon. People seem very small in comparison to the immense cliffs, valleys, and the mighty river. Pocahontas and John Smith. In 1606, King James of England approved the establishment of two colonies along the eastern coast of America. The northern colony in Maine lasted only a year. The southern one at Jamestown in Virginia became England's first permanent settlement in America. In 1607, the Virginia Company sent 104 settlers to Virginia. The settlers lived in tents all summer. By September, more than 60 were dead because they lacked good food or water. The leaders of the colony were not energetic and did little to make the settlers find food. One member of the company, Captain John Smith, was determined that the colony would survive. Smith pressured the colonists to build huts, a storehouse, and a church. He made daring trips to Indian villages, demanding that they give the settlers food in return for beads and copper. He threatened settlers who were trying to leave the colony and go back to England. On one of his trips to the interior, Indians attacked John Smith. They killed his two companions, but captured him alive. He was taken first to the local chief. This chief was impressed by Smith's compass and spared his life. His captors dragged Smith from village to village. He finally arrived at the town belonging to Powhatan. Powhatan was the great chief for all of the tribes in that region. Powhatan and his advisers talked about what to do with Smith. Suddenly, Smith was dragged forward, and his head was pushed against a stone. The warriors raised their clubs to kill Smith. Then Pocahontas, who was Powhatan's twelve-year-old daughter, begged for his life. Her words had no effect, so Pocahontas ran to Smith. She took his hand in her arms and laid her own head against his head. Smith was released and went back to Jamestown. Soon after Smith returned, one hundred new settlers from England arrived. It was a very cold winter, and in January, Jamestown was accidentally set on fire. The settlers suffered from cold and hunger the rest of the winter. Every four or five days, Pocahontas and her attendants came. They brought food for the hungry settlers. Even so, half of them died. In the summer, John Smith explored that part of the coast of America. He made a map that would be very valuable for future sailors and settlers. On his return, Smith was elected leader of the colony at Jamestown. However, some settlers did not like having to follow rules. Some encouraged the Indians to try to kill Smith. Chief Powhatan agreed. He also refused to supply food to the colony, hoping to starve them out. Pocahontas warned Smith about the plot against his life. Smith had to fight off several attempts to kill him. Finally, the colony seemed to be growing, and the Indians became peaceful. But in late 1609, Smith was injured in an explosion and returned to England. Pocahontas remained a friend to the colony. She married John Rolfe, one of the settlers. In 1616, she traveled to England with her husband and son. 
There she saw John Smith once again. She was so surprised to see him that she was unable to speak for several days. Pocahontas had believed that Smith was dead. The following year, she died and was buried in England. Pocahontas' love for Smith and Smith's determination to fight for the colony had saved Jamestown and given the English their first colony in America. Remember the Alamo The first Europeans in the American Southwest were Spanish explorers and conquerors. They were followed by religious orders that set up missions to Christianize the Indians. One of these missions was San Antonio de Valero. It was founded in 1718 in what is now San Antonio, Texas. Later, the mission structure became known as the Alamo. In 1821, Moses Austin had persuaded the Spanish authorities to give him a charter to settle 200,000 acres in Texas. The elder Austin died shortly after this. Five weeks later, his son Stephen Austin traveled to San Antonio to have this charter confirmed by the Spanish governor. In 1822, Austin led 150 settlers into Texas. When Austin learned afterwards that Mexico was now independent of Spain, he journeyed to Mexico City to have his charter reconfirmed. The Mexicans appointed Austin regional administrator for his colony. Texas grew rapidly. Cotton farming and cattle ranching were profitable and attracted American settlers. By 1830, there were 16,000 Americans in Texas, four times the Spanish-Mexican population. Sam Houston had been a successful soldier and politician. He was a friend and supporter of President Andrew Jackson. However, personal problems and political difficulties led him to leave the USA for Texas. Meanwhile, the struggle for control of Mexico had been won in 1833 by Santa Ana. However, the independent thinking of the Texans infuriated Santa Ana. He had Stephen Austin thrown in jail and sent an army into Texas. Austin was released from jail in time to organize the defense of Texas. The Mexican army was besieged inside the Alamo and, after fierce fighting, surrendered. The Mexicans were allowed to go home. Sam Houston was now elected the state's supreme commander. Not long after this, Santa Ana approached Texas with an army of 6,000 men. Houston decided not to meet Santa Ana in open battle, but to wait for an advantage. He sent frontiersman Jim Bowie to the Alamo. Bowie's orders were to leave San Antonio and destroy the Alamo. When Bowie arrived, however, Texas volunteers were preparing the Alamo for a siege. Bowie and his men pitched in to help. Other volunteers came. The fiery William Travis arrived with 25 men. Then the famous frontiersman, Davy Crockett, came with a dozen Tennessee sharpshooters. When Santa Ana attacked, there were 183 Americans inside the fort. Santa Ana brought up cannon to bombard the Alamo. As the walls began to crumble, 4,000 Mexicans attacked from all four sides. The Mexicans overcame all resistance because of their large numbers, but they suffered very heavy losses. All the American defenders were killed. While the battle was raging, the Texans back at the colony declared their independence from Mexico. Sam Houston now gathered men to fight the Mexican army. At first he retreated while waiting for a suitable opportunity. When Santa Ana's rapid advance left the bulk of the Mexican army behind, Houston prepared to fight. Santa Ana's advance troops moved into swampy land by the San Jacinto River. Houston's men attacked while the Mexicans were having their midday siesta. Their battle cry was, Remember the Alamo! The battle was soon over. Many Mexicans were killed, but only a couple of Texans were killed. Santa Ana was a prisoner. Santa Ana readily agreed now to recognize Texas as an independent republic. Ninety years later, in 1845, Texas became the 28th state of the USA. Gribio St. Francis of Assisi, who lived in Italy in the early 13th century, was known for his love of animals. He was the first person who celebrated the birth of Jesus by gathering live animals around a manger. He often talked to the birds as he traveled along. Sometimes the birds would fly down and sit on his head, shoulders, knees, and arms. But the best-known animal story concerns St. Francis and the wolf of Gribio. St. Francis was known for his humility and his unwillingness to hurt anyone. Once, when one of his followers spoke harshly to some bandits, 
St. Francis told the man to run after the bandits and apologize. In the same way, St. Francis thought of animals as his brothers and sisters. Once, when he was warned about some dangerous wolves, he replied that he had never harmed Brother Wolf and didn't expect the wolf to harm him. While St. Francis was staying in the hill town of Gribio, he heard about a large, fierce wolf. The townspeople were terrified of this wolf and had eaten both domestic animals and humans. St. Francis decided to help the people and went out to talk to the wolf. The people watched in horror as the wolf came running to attack St. Francis. But the saint made the sign of the cross. Then he said to the wolf that, in the name of Jesus, it should stop hurting people. The wolf then lay down at St. Francis' feet. St. Francis addressed a little sermon to the wolf. He recounted all the terrible things that the wolf had done, but he added that he wanted to make peace between the wolf and the townspeople. The wolf nodded its head in approval. In return for the wolf's agreement to keep the peace, St. Francis promised him that he would arrange for the townspeople to feed him. When he asked the wolf never again to harm any person or animal, the wolf nodded again. Then the wolf put out its paw as a sign that it would keep its promise. The wolf walked beside St. Francis back into Gribio. When a crowd assembled, the saint preached to them about how God had allowed the wolf to terrify them because of their sins. He told them to repent, and God would forgive them. Then he spoke of the promise that the wolf had made, and what he had promised the wolf in return. The people agreed to feed the wolf regularly, and the wolf again indicated that it would not hurt anyone. Again, it put its paw in St. Francis's hand. The wolf and the people kept the agreement. Two years later, the wolf died. The people remembered how it no longer hurt anyone, and that not a single dog ever barked at it. The townspeople of Gribio lamented its death. Whenever it went through town, it had reminded them of the virtues and holiness of St. Francis. Cowboys The golden age of the American cowboy was short-lived. It began in the 1860s with the great cattle drives from Texas north to Kansas. By 1890, when railroads had reached remote areas, there was no more need for large-scale cattle drives. Of course, cowboys have a history before 1860. In fact, there were Mexican cowboys long before that. The Spanish conqueror of Mexico, Hernán Cortés, brought cattle with him in 1521. Cortés also branded his cattle with a three-cross design. The Spanish sharp-horned cattle roamed the deserts and prairies freely. Eventually, they found their way to Texas. American settlers in Texas interbred their animals with the Spanish breed. The Texas longhorn cow was the result. It was famous for its bad temper and aggressiveness. The longhorn was a dangerous animal, with each of its horns measuring up to three and one-half feet long. After the American Civil War ended in 1865, disbanded soldiers who were former black slaves and young men seeking adventure headed west. At that time, there were about five million cattle in Texas. Back in the east, there was a big demand for beef. By this time, railways from the east extended as far west as Kansas. It was still more than 600 miles from south Texas to the railway. Between the two places, there were rivers to cross, Indian tribes, badlands, and other problems. A fur trader named Jesse Chisholm had driven his wagon north in 1865. Cowboys and cattle followed the Chisholm Trail north to Abilene, Kansas. This cattle trail became the most famous route for driving cattle until it was barred with barbed wire in 1884. In 1867, cattle dealer Joseph G. McCoy built pens for 3,000 cattle in the little town of Abilene. Soon, Abilene was the most dangerous town in America. After the long cattle drive, cowboys who had just been paid went wild. Sheriff Wild Bill Hickok tamed Abilene in 1871 by forcing cowboys to turn over their guns when they arrived in town. Other towns replaced Abilene as the wildest town in the West, Newton, Wichita, Ellsworth, and Dodge City. 
In Kansas, a herd of 3,000 Texas Longhorns might sell for $100,000, making the rancher rich. The cowboys might get $200 in wages, which often disappeared on drink, women, and gambling. Getting cattle to Kansas was far from easy. One of the biggest difficulties was getting the herd across rivers, especially when the river was high. There were no bridges. In 1871, 350 cowboys driving 60,000 cattle waited two weeks for the water level in the Red River to go down. Food for men and animals was also difficult to find at times. An early cattleman developed the chuck wagon, which were both a supply wagon and a portable kitchen. In the 1870s, there were probably 40,000 cowboys in the West. After the prairies were fenced in, there was less work. Large ranches still employ cowboys to round up the cattle for branding or for sale. Even today, about 20,000 cowboys still work in North America. George W. Bush, Jr. George W. Bush, Jr. was inaugurated as the 43rd President of the United States on January 20, 2001. Of course, people knew that he was the son of the 41st President, George H. W. Bush. He had also been Governor of Texas since 1994. However, aside from this, he was not very well known outside of Texas. Why, then, did so many people want him to run for President in 2000? Many Republicans thought that the Democrats could be defeated in 2000, but they themselves lacked a candidate with strong appeal. As the election approached, leading Republicans worried about whom to support. Some of the most powerful Republicans were state governors. They began to look around at each other for a possible candidate. Most eyes turned to George W. Bush, the governor of Texas. In November 1998, Bush was re-elected as governor by an impressive margin. By now, Bush was the leading Republican candidate in the polls. Of course, one advantage that Governor Bush had was a familiar name. In fact, when he did well in some early polls, it is likely that some people really voted for his father. They thought that George H.W. Bush was running again. The Bush family was able to swing a lot of support to George W. It also helped that his brother Jeb was now governor of Florida. Parents George and Barbara were both born in eastern United States, but in 1948, George moved to Texas where he made a fortune in the oil business. He went into politics in the 1960s and 70s and served in a number of important positions. He was Ronald Reagan's vice president from 1981 to 1989 and president from 1989 to 1993. George W. was born in 1946, the oldest of the Bush children. Three more brothers and two sisters were also born. The youngest sister died of leukemia as a child. George W. attended the same prestigious eastern colleges as his father. Then he came back to Texas and was a fighter pilot with the Texas Air National Guard. During the early 70s, he wandered from place to place trying different jobs. After attending Harvard Business School from 1972 to 1975, he came back to Texas and started his own oil exploration company. Although it wasn't as profitable as his father's company, he eventually sold his stock shares for a considerable amount of money. In 1978, he ran for the Senate of the United States, but was defeated. He became closely involved in his father's campaign for president in 1988. Here he developed a lot of the political skills he was later able to use to run for office himself. In 1989, back in Texas, George W. organized a group that bought the Texas Rangers baseball team. He later sold the team in 1998 and made a $14 million profit. In 1994, he surprised the political world by defeating the incumbent governor of Texas. As governor, he pushed ahead with an energetic program, which reflected neoconservative values. However, George W. did not appear as an ideologist to people. Even his opponents were willing to work with him. When he ran for president in 2000, Bush described himself as a compassionate conservative. Only time will tell how successful Bush will be as U.S. president. Handel's Messiah George Frederick Handel was a native of Germany and spoke with a German accent all his life. 
Most of that life, however, was spent in London, England. As a young musician, Handel's sponsor was the Elector of Hanover. Later on, when the Elector became King George the First of England, he continued to sponsor Handel. The young Handel went to Italy to study opera. Opera had become a very fashionable entertainment for the upper classes. Handel traveled to England in 1711 and made an immediate success with his operas. Queen Anne granted him a royal pension for life in 1713. Because of this initial success, Handel tried to start a permanent opera company in London, but this failed and Handel lost money. Since operas used full stage settings with costumes, scenery, and props, they were expensive to produce. Handel decided to produce oratorios in which the parts were simply sung without actions. On August twenty-second, seventeen forty-one, Handel began to work on his oratorio, The Messiah. The text was made up of passages from the Bible relating to the birth, life, and death of Jesus. Handel worked on it feverishly, missing meals and going without sleep. He finished it twenty-four days later. When he was asked how he felt on completing it, Handel said, "I thought I saw all heaven before me and the great God Himself." In the fall of 1741, Handel received an invitation from the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland to present operas and concerts there. Handel traveled from London to Dublin with his entire luggage and many of his singers. However, in order to rehearse on the way, he had to hire local people to fill in. Once the composer soundly criticized one local singer who failed to meet his standards. Handel was warmly received in Dublin, where his concerts were sold out. Even his rehearsals were considered newsworthy by the local papers. The Messiah was first publicly performed on April thirteenth, seventeen forty-two. Seven hundred people squeezed into a six hundred seat theater to hear it. A notice had requested that ladies attend in hoopless skirts and that gentlemen come without their swords. A Dublin paper reported: "Words are wanting to express the exquisite delight it afforded to the admiring crowded audience." All proceeds were donated to charity, as the church choirs had refused to participate except on those conditions. Handel returned to London in August 1742 and prepared the oratorio for the London stage. The Messiah made its London debut on March 23, 1743, with King George II in the audience. It was during the Hallelujah chorus that the king jumped to his feet and so initiated a tradition that has lasted ever since. With such oratories, Handel was able to re-establish his popularity and restore his finances in London. The Messiah continued to be performed. After conducting it on April sixth, seventeen fifty-nine, the old composer collapsed and had to be carried home. He died eight days later. The Messiah remains Handel's most popular work, combining wonderful music with inspiring religious sentiments. The biblical text speaks of hope and salvation, and the music allows the text to soar into angelic songs. Newspapers. All the great cities in the world now have newspapers, but newspapers as we know them today are not that old. The very first newspapers began long after the invention of printing. They started in Europe in the 1600s and were usually only a couple of pages long. For a long time, newspapers were not very common. Governments didn't want public discussion of their policies and decisions. Often, they closed down papers or taxed them heavily. The stamp tax on newspapers and pamphlets was one of the causes of the American Revolution. Newspapers began to grow in size when they discovered advertising as a source of income. Nowadays, advertising is the main revenue source for most newspapers. As newspapers became more widely circulated, they could ask for more money for their advertisements. By the late 18th century, newspapers were in common use in Europe. The 1800s and early 1900s was the golden age of newspapers. Improvements in transportation, communication, and printing processes made it easier to collect news from near and far and to publish papers more quickly and more cheaply. The Weekly Dispatch and the Times, both of London, England, were leading newspapers through much of the 1800s. The Times was one of the first papers to include illustrations. 
It was the first newspaper to use a steam engine to turn the presses. When the tax on newspapers was reduced in 1836, the Times was able to increase its size considerably. In 1840, it began to use the telegraph to collect news stories. In 1855, the tax on newspapers was finally lifted. The Times made its greatest reputation during the Crimean War between Britain and Russia. British armies fighting in Russia's Crimean Peninsula were not only unsuccessful in the war, but were suffering severely from illnesses. The Times sent out the world's first war correspondent, William Howard Russell, in 1854. His reports from the battle lines had a powerful effect on the British public. A war fund was organized to help the soldiers. Russell forced the government to accept the offer of Florence Nightingale to organize nurses to travel to Crimea. A photographer, Roger Fenton, sent back photos from the war, which were published in the Times. Meanwhile, in America, a more popular approach to newspapers had developed. The newspaper had spread west with the pioneers, and nearly every little settlement had its own paper. American newspapers were cheaper and livelier than British ones. They were aimed at the average person rather than the governing class. Examples of the new style of editing and publishing were Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. Hearst, especially, employed sensational and emotional writing, which aimed at stirring up the public to action. Hearst is sometimes accused of starting the Spanish-American War of 1898 with his overheated editorials. Nonetheless, his methods were successful in raising circulation and were widely imitated. The modern newspaper contains more than hard news. In fact, news may be a fairly small part of it: advertisements, gossip, show business, photos of celebrities, sports, stock market prices, horoscopes, comic strips, weather reports, and much more are found in its pages. The modern newspaper is a total entertainment package. A question for the future is whether electronic newspapers will replace paper newspapers. Paul Kane, frontier artist. Since Christopher Columbus first met American Indians in 1492, many Europeans had been fascinated by Indian life and culture. As a result, there was a demand in Europe for drawings and paintings of Native Americans. European artists who had never seen an Indian supplied most of this demand. But in the 19th century, several painters traveled into Indian territory to make an authentic record of native life. One of the first artists to do this was the American painter George Catlin. In 1841, Catlin published a book of his work. Catlin's work helped inspire another important frontier artist, the Canadian Paul Kane. Paul Kane was born in Ireland in 1810. His family moved to Toronto, Ontario, Canada, when Paul was nine years old. The young boy was not very interested in school. At that time, there were still Indians living in wigwams in the Toronto area. Young Paul liked visiting the Indian village instead of going to school. Since Paul spent little time in school, he was largely a self-taught artist. He also became a surprisingly good writer, considering that he had not spent much time studying spelling or grammar. After working some years making and decorating furniture, Kane was ready to travel. He spent the years from 1836 to 1841 living and traveling in the United States. Then he traveled in Europe from 1841 to 1843, studying the great painters of the past. He was back in the USA until 1845, and then he returned to Toronto. Immediately upon his return, Kane headed into the wilderness areas around Georgian Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, and Lake Michigan. His plan was to sketch Indian life before it disappeared forever. American Indians were dying so rapidly from European diseases such as measles and smallpox that many people believed they would soon vanish as a race. Their culture was threatened too. As white settlers demanded more land, Indians were being herded into small pieces of land called reservations. Here they could no longer practice their traditional way of life. Kane wanted to capture Native American life while it still existed. Kane returned to Toronto at the end of 1845. He had received one good piece of advice, and that was if he wanted to travel into the wilderness, he would have to go with experienced people. 
he was able to get the support of the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, Sir George Simpson. In May 1846, Kane joined the annual canoe fleet of fur traders going west. Kane would travel all through the wilderness areas of western Canada and northwestern USA. During this time, he made hundreds of sketches of Indian life. Although Kane faced incredible hardships during his travels, he was able to see what he wanted to see. He was able to take part in one of the last great buffalo hunts and killed two large bison himself. Traveling west with the fur traders, he visited many forts and trading posts. He saw and painted a prairie fire. He shot a grizzly bear at close range and killed several wolves that attacked his horses. He learned to travel long distances on snowshoes in winter. Finally, he arrived at the Pacific coast, where he made some fine drawings of the West Coast Indians. European diseases had reached there just before Cain. 1,500 Indians had died near Fort Vancouver in the summer of 1848. One wealthy chief had ruled 1,000 warriors and had 10 wives, 4 children, and 18 slaves. Now, he had only one wife, one child, and two slaves. Cain had not come too soon. However, there were tribes still unaffected by Western culture and Western diseases. Cain also traveled widely around the Columbia River in northwestern USA. Everywhere he went, he sketched Indian chiefs and scenes of native life. On his return trip, he encountered a large war party of 1,500 braves on the warpath against their traditional enemies. He was able to sketch the leading chief, Big Snake, who was later killed in single combat during the battle. When he arrived back in Toronto, Kane gave an exhibit of his sketches and watercolors. Most of the rest of his life was spent turning these drawings into finished paintings. Plains Indians The best-known picture of an American Indian is a warrior in buckskin riding a horse, wearing a headdress of eagle feathers, and carrying a spear or bow and arrow. This is a picture of a Plains Indian, and it appears in many Hollywood westerns and on the American five-cent piece. There were many tribes of Plains Indians, for the northern American prairies or plains stretch from the northern forest of western Canada down to the states of Oklahoma and Texas in southern USA. It's interesting that our image of the Plains Indian is only true for the last couple hundred years. It was not until the 1600s that Plains Indians began to ride horses. There were no horses in America until Spanish soldiers brought them in the 1500s and 1600s. Some of these horses escaped and ran wild on the prairies of America. It was these wild horses that the Plains Indians learned to tame. Before they had horses, the Indians hunted buffalo on foot. Buffalo were huge bison or wild cattle which traveled in very large herds. A big herd might have millions of buffalo. It was difficult to cross the prairie because these animals blocked your way. The Plains Indians had various ways of killing buffalo. Before they had horses, Indian hunters would quietly creep up close to the herd. Then they would fire their arrows together. There was always the danger that the herd would stampede and trample the hunters. Another method was to drive the buffalo over a steep cliff. There are a number of places on the plains where this was done. Once the Plains Indians had horses, they preferred to hunt buffalo on horseback. When the tribe started to use guns, they could kill many buffalo. Artist Paul Kane describes a buffalo hunt in the Red River Valley in 1846. The hunters carried their bullets in their mouths so that they could shoot faster. They could ride right into the herd, shooting at close quarters. They would drop an article of clothes on the slain buffalo to mark it for themselves. Then they would continue the hunt. After the hunt, the Indians would skin the animals, and the women would dry the meat and store it in fat. A single hunt might kill more than 30,000 buffalo. The Plains Indians received nearly everything they needed from the buffalo. Of course, they used buffalo meat for food. They also used the buffalo skins for clothing, blankets, and the covering of their teepees. These teepees were cone-shaped tents, which were easy to put up and take down. The Plains Indians were nomadic and followed the animals they hunted. Since these animals were plentiful, Plains Indians usually led a comfortable life. They developed complex religions and social rituals, as well as specialized societies or clubs. There were also rituals and customs for hunting and warfare. 
Many Plains Indians fought hard against the settlement of the Great Plains. The American government discouraged the hunting of buffalo because without the buffalo, the Plains Indians would not be able to fight. With the buffalo disappearing, the Plains Indians had to give up fighting and move into government sponsored reservations. Ireland Ireland is an island in the Atlantic Ocean, just west of Britain. For much of its history, it has been an advantage to Ireland to be far from the mainland. The Romans or the other early empires never conquered Ireland. It was the remoteness of Ireland that helped preserve much of Christian and classical culture. After the fall of the Roman Empire, wandering tribes destroyed much of what remained on the continent. Finally, it was Ireland's turn to be invaded. First, the Norsemen or Vikings attacked during the 800s and 900s. Then, in the 1100s, the English invaded Ireland. Since that time, there has always been an English presence in Ireland. The conflict between the English and the Irish grew worse in the 1500s. Then the English became Protestant, and the Irish remained Catholic. In the 1600s, Oliver Cromwell tried to make Ireland Protestant by driving out the Catholics and bringing in Protestant settlers. In the centuries following, Irish Catholics had very few rights in their own country. The Catholic Irish were not allowed to vote until 1829. Since Irish Catholics were not allowed to own land, they were poor tenant farmers. They paid rent to the English landlords. The main food crop in the 1840s was potatoes. When these became infected by blight, thousands of Irishmen starved. Many others were evicted from their dwellings because they couldn't pay the rent. Hundreds of thousands of Irish took ship for North America. The Catholic Irish preferred to go to the United States because Canada was under British influence. However, many Protestant Irish went to Canada. The influence of the Irish on North American culture has been very great in many areas. Prominent Irish Americans include Presidents John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan. Meanwhile, in Ireland itself, a strong independence movement developed. A rebellion against England in 1916 began a struggle that resulted in independence for most of Ireland. Some Protestant areas in Northern Ireland preferred to stay with England. Republican groups, such as the Irish Republican Army, wanted to liberate the North from British rule. Nowadays, conflict between Protestants and Catholics is limited to these northern counties. Constant attempts are being made to bring the conflict there to an end. Meanwhile, the Irish Republic of Air has become prosperous again. It can sell its agricultural products to the European common market. Irish beer and whiskey are sold all over the world. Ireland is also becoming known for its high tech industries. Because of this relative prosperity, the population is increasing again after a century and a half of decline. The Irish differ from other people because the vast majority of Irishmen live away from their homeland. However, this exodus from Ireland has helped to spread Irish music, culture, and products around the world. On St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, nearly everyone becomes Irish for the day. Then there is a great party with Celtic music, Irish dancing, green beer, and the wearing of the green. Louisa May Alcott. New England in the early and middle years of the 19th century had a flourishing culture. People were passionately interested in ideas and education. Most New Englanders were strongly opposed to slavery. They were also concerned about other social issues. New ideas resulted in new kinds of writing. These ideas included the importance of doing what seemed right for them, no matter how different it was from what other people thought. People also believed that nature gave them guidance in our lives and that it was important to live close to nature. These and other ideas were expressed through teaching and writing. Bronson Alcott was one of those who looked at the world in a new way. He looked for work as a teacher so that he could pass on his ideas to others. However, very few parents wanted Mr. Alcott to teach their children, and very few people were interested in hearing his speeches or reading his books. As a result, the Alcott family was very poor. Fortunately for Bronson, he married a very capable and energetic woman. Mrs. Abigail Alcott helped to earn money to support the family and did most of the work involved in looking after the four Alcott girls. The oldest daughter, Anna, 
was quiet and serious. She rarely got into trouble and was a good helper at home. The second daughter was Louisa May Alcott, who became a writer. She was adventurous and cared very little for rules. She was always saying and doing things that got her into trouble. The third daughter, Elizabeth, was very kind and good natured. All the others loved her. As a young woman, Elizabeth had a severe case of scarlet fever and never fully recovered. She died at age 23. The youngest sister, May, was talented, but she was rather spoiled. Because there was never enough money, the Alcott girls felt pressure to work at an early age, but this did not stop them from having fun. Louisa wrote little plays that she and her sisters performed at home. They all enjoyed the woods and ponds around Concord, Massachusetts, where they lived most of these years. When they moved back to Boston in 1848, Anna took a job looking after other people's children, and Louisa looked after the house. Meanwhile, their mother worked outside the home. While working on laundry or sewing, Louisa was thinking up stories. At night, she would write them down. When she was 18, she began selling poems and stories to magazines. Within 10 years, Louisa was earning a substantial income from writing. One day, her publisher suggested that she write a story for girls. At first, Louisa didn't like the suggestion, but when she started to write, the ideas came rapidly. Her book was based on her own family and her own childhood. Little Women was published in 1868 and was an immediate success. The March family was very much like the Alcotts. Mrs. Alcott resembles Marmy. Meg is like Anna, and Joe is like Louisa herself. Beth is based on Elizabeth, and Amy on May Alcott. Many of the situations in the book happened to the Alcott family. Nonetheless, many characters and incidents were invented. Little Women and its sequel opened up a new kind of writing for children. While these books did have a moral, they were more lively and interesting than earlier children's writing. Little Women inspired many writers later to write more realistic accounts of childhood. Niagara on the Lake Niagara on the Lake is a little town at the mouth of the Niagara River. It is only 12 miles north of Niagara Falls. It used to be true that very few tourists would bother to travel from the falls down to Niagara on the Lake. Nowadays, however, the little town itself is a major tourist attraction. The town has a remarkable history. The area played an important role in both the American Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. As a result, the little town has two forts Fort George and Fort Mississauga. When Fort George was reconstructed for the public in the 1930s, Niagara on the Lake got its first big tourist attraction. Because Niagara on the Lake was the first capital of Ontario, it has many significant firsts. There was the first parliament in the province, the first legal society, the first library, the first newspaper, the first museum building, and many more firsts. Besides its history, the town, which is bordered by Lake Ontario and the Niagara River, has beautiful scenery. On a summer's day, visitors can watch the sailboats going out the river to the lake. On the land side, Niagara is part of the fruit belt of Ontario. Peaches, pears, apples, cherries, and strawberries grow here in abundance. There are also long rows of vines, and winemaking has recently become a major industry. The mild, humid climate allows plants to flourish. The trees, especially the oaks, grow to remarkable heights. Flowering trees and shrubs perfume the air in the spring. Gardens are often spectacular for much of the year. Because of this, Niagara on the Lake attracts many painters and photographers. Many of the private homes also have a long history, and great care is taken to keep them looking their best. The biggest single attraction is the Shaw Festival Theatre. The festival was founded in 1962 by a group of Shaw enthusiasts. Early productions were often held in the historic courthouse on the main street, and plays still take place there. In 1973, however, a new 861 seat Shaw Theatre was built at the south end of town.
Since then, traffic to Niagara-on-the-Lake has been steady all through the long summer season. In 1996, Niagara-on-the-Lake was voted the prettiest town in Canada. Partly, it is the scale of things that makes the old town so attractive. The old town is only about eight blocks long by eight blocks wide. It has a population of little more than 1,000 people. Nonetheless, there is a lot for people to do and see. There are many interesting shops, old hotels, bookstores, art galleries, museums, a golf course, a marina, historic churches and cemeteries, several parks, three theaters, and lots of restaurants. Because it is small, Niagara-on-the-Lake is a good place to walk around or bicycle around. There are also horse and wagon rides. Although the main street can be hectic in tourist season, one doesn't have to go far off the main street to get in touch with an older, slower time. Most of the downtown buildings haven't changed much since the days of Queen Victoria, and tourists can still imagine that they are back in the days before computers and television. Summertime. In North America, July and August are holiday months. Most schools and colleges are not in session then. Families look for activities to keep the children amused. Although not all workers get a full two months of holidays, most people take a holiday in the summer. The summer begins with a national holiday. In Canada, July 1st is Canada Day. In the USA, July 4th is Independence Day. A lot of families are soon on the road. Some travel to cottages by the lake. Some go sightseeing or camping. In Canada especially, the summers are short so people try to make the most of them. In much of Canada and parts of the northern USA are woodlands dotted with lakes. These regions of rocks, rivers, pine trees and wild animals are not usually suitable for farming. However, they are ideal places to spend a summer holiday. They are far from the cities. The woods are quiet and peaceful. People fish, go boating or swimming, have barbecues outside, or play outdoor sports. Some people spend their whole summer at the cottage. Others go for a week or two. City people who don't have a cottage like to go to parks and swimming pools in the city. If they are near a lake or ocean, they may go there for the day. Many museums, libraries, and art galleries have programs for children in the summer. Swimming is probably the favorite summer sport. It feels wonderful on a very hot day to jump into the cool water. Swimming is also excellent exercise. Besides swimming, baseball and football are also popular in the summer. Spending an afternoon or evening at a baseball game is a favorite summer pastime. Summer is also a favorite time to catch up on reading. Stories of adventures and love novels are favorite light reading. But summer is especially a time for traveling across the country. Some people have a camper or trailer that they can live in. Some stay in campgrounds and sleep in tents. Others stay at hotels or motels, while others rent cottages or cabins for a week or two. Most trips are by car. Many people visit national parks and other wildlife areas. Of course, trips along the ocean and the lakes are favorites. Along the Atlantic Ocean, the coasts of New England and Canada's maritime provinces are especially popular. On the Pacific Coast, tourists travel from California all the way up to Alaska. Boat cruises along the shores of British Columbia and Alaska are especially popular. Of course, some people find it most relaxing just to stay at home. Others cannot afford to travel. If you have an air-conditioned house with a television, video player, CD player, and computer, then it can be very pleasant to stay at home. A lot of new movies are released at the theaters in the summer. Air-conditioned theaters with new movies and lots of pop and popcorn are favorite summer places. After two months of summer activities, most people are ready to go back to school and work, but they usually have lots of happy memories to take back with them. Telephone Systems When Alexander Graham Bell developed the telephone in the 1870s, it was fairly simple to use. You talked into the mouthpiece and then held it to your ear to listen. For a century or so, using the telephone meant either contacting the operator to dial a number or dialing yourself. After that, all you had to do was talk or listen. Nowadays, the telephone has become a very complex instrument. It rivals the computer as to the number of possible uses. Answering machines have been around for several decades, but they are now being replaced by voicemail. 
Voicemail does away with the need for an answering machine. Messages are stored on the system. That means it's possible to forward the message to someone else's phone or transfer the call to a more convenient phone of your own. You can also use call pickup so that anyone on your group can answer another's phone. Conference calls have become very common. This is when one person phones first one person, then another, and keeps adding people to the telephone conversation. This can regularly be done with up to six people. It is very useful for business discussions where different people need to talk about the same thing. It also speeds up the process of consensus and allows everybody to be in on the decision or discussion. The modern phone has many more features. If you don't want the caller to know what is being said in your office, you can push the mute button. If you want to hang up without putting the receiver down, press goodbye. If you don't want to receive calls, just forward them all into your voicemail. Newer phones will indicate when you have voicemail messages. If you have trouble with these features, an automatic voice will tell you your options. This help system is built into the telephone. For example, the help voice will tell you how to set up a distribution list so that you can send the same voice message to a number of people. It will also tell you how to send a message directly into someone's voicemail. You can designate your message to go to the top of the recipient's voicemail list. You can also program it so that the recipient cannot forward it. Some systems have limits on how much space can be used for individual voicemail. There are a number of courtesies that voicemail users should follow. Your greeting on your voicemail should be simple. If you are unable to take calls for any reason, you might want to explain that in your recorded greeting. If you are on vacation, you might want to include that information in your greeting. Don't use voicemail as a way to avoid answering the telephone. Some people use voicemail to screen calls. This can be annoying to someone who can never contact you directly. Check your messages regularly and reply to them promptly. Enjoy the telecommunications revolution. Re Texas. The state of Texas is famous for having the biggest and best of everything. Before Alaska became a state, Texas was the largest American state. It was also famous for its huge cattle ranches. Cotton is a major crop, but much of the wealth comes from oil and gas. People think of Texans as being wealthy because there have been lots of cattle and oil millionaires. In the late 19th century, Texas cattlemen used to drive their herds north to Kansas. There, a train to the east shipped the cows. Eventually, the railroad came to Texas, and the great cattle drive stopped. By then, many Texans owned large ranches and were quite wealthy. In the 20th century, oil has made many Texans wealthy. Oil refining has led to chemical industries and synthetic products. Most Texans now live in cities. Many oil companies have their headquarters in Dallas. Other large manufacturing cities are Houston, Corpus Christi, Fort Worth, and Austin, which is the capital of Texas. Several cities, such as San Antonio and El Paso, have a strong Spanish influence. This dates back to the first Spanish visitors in the 16th century. The old mission at San Antonio is famous as the Alamo, where an important battle for Texas independence was fought. Texas is a huge area with mountains, deserts, prairies, rivers, and islands. The rugged beauty of its grasslands and deserts attracts many tourists. For a state that is mostly dry, Texas has a remarkable variety of wildflowers in the spring. Its animals and birds differ from other parts of the USA. Texas has the armored insect eater, the armadillo, the swift running bird, the road runner, prairie dogs, jackrabbits, kangaroo rats, wild pigs, horned lizards, and 100 species of snakes. As might be expected also, it has many beautiful kinds of cacti and other desert plants. At its largest, Texas is more than 600 miles wide by 600 miles long. Such a large area develops a distinct culture of its own, and Texans are widely recognized by their accent and manner of speaking, their attitudes and interests, and their sense of independence and self-reliance. Texas is also known for its beautiful women, who regularly win national beauty contests. Its men have a reputation for being rugged, for not talking more than they have to, and for being straightforward and honest. Although many people think of cowboys and Indians when they think of Texas, it is a center for high-tech industries. The American Space Program has its headquarters in Houston, and Mission Control Center is there. Texas is also an important manufacturer of computers and other high-tech products. 
Oil production is still important in Texas, but it ranks third as a source of revenue behind manufacturing and tourism. The colorful history of Texas and its wonderful scenery contribute to a thriving tourist industry. Texas is also an important business and financial area. Yes, even though times have changed, Texans proudly maintain that their state still has the biggest and best of everything. Come to the fair. Fall fairs have been a feature of North American life since early in the 19th century. At the end of the harvest, people from rural areas have come together to celebrate. Usually, these fairs take the form of a competition regarding the best of all farm products of that year. Depending on the part of the country and its most important crop, fall fairs can begin as early as August or as late as November. They usually last several days. When the United States and Canada were organized, they were divided into small units called counties. Larger units were called states or provinces. Many of the best-known fairs are county fairs or state fairs. There are also smaller local fairs and larger ones too, like the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto, Ontario. Since these fairs are usually annual events, many have developed permanent buildings over the years. Most of these are large barn-like structures. These buildings are used to display new products for farm life, such as tractors, home furnishings, and water systems. Several barns are usually necessary to house all the horses, cows, pigs, goats, sheep, chickens, and other animals in competition. There must also be room to display all the vegetables, berries, and fruits in competition. Finally, there is space for handicrafts, artwork. Baked goods and jams and jellies. Usually, there is a grandstand, which is a stage with wooden seats around it. Here, entertainers perform for an audience during the fair. Country and western singers are usually popular at fairs, but so are comedians, clowns, dancers, and musicians. There may also be other contests, such as a beauty competition for queen of the fair, tests of strength for the men, or pie-eating events. Most fairs also have a race track, which is used for horse racing, or in some cases, auto racing. Fairs have helped to improve animal breeds, and races encourage the breeding of fast horses. Plowing contests test the strength and steadiness of horses, and so do pulling contests. This spirit of competition has led to improvements in all areas of farming. Every kind of grain, fruit. Vegetable, berry, and animal is tested, and only the best win a ribbon. This encourages fairness to improve their products. Farm women compete to produce the best homemade food and crafts. Many kinds of fruit and vegetables are stored in glass jars for the winter. The best of these also receive prizes. Most fairs have a dining area where there is good food served to the public. The goal of improving farming is sponsored by the governments of Canada and the USA. 4-H clubs are youth organizations that encourage farm children to take an interest in farming. 4-H clubs aim at improving the heads, hearts, hands, and health of their members. There are also women's organizations, such as the Women's Institutes in Canada, which work to make the life of farm families better. Fall fairs have taken over the idea of the midway from the circus. The midway has rides like Ferris wheels, merry-go-rounds, and roller coasters. It also has games of chance and skill, such as trying to throw a small hoop over a large bottle. One nice thing about fall fairs is that they are fun for the whole family. Children enjoy the midway and the farm animals. Women like the crafts, food, and household exhibits. Men like the machinery, the horse races, and the crop exhibits. Everyone likes the grandstand shows. Nowadays, not so many people live on farms, but people from towns and cities still enjoy going to fall fairs. They are part of our North American heritage. Hiroshima. North American children know about Hiroshima. They are taught about the dangers of nuclear war. Sometimes they learn the details of the damage that was done. They learn about what happened at 8:15 a.m. on August 6, 1945. People were eating breakfast. 
Children were going to school and adults going to work. There was a blinding flash of light, a scorching heat, and a mushroom cloud rose up. People close to the explosion were instantly vaporized. Many of those further away would die from burns and radiation. Sixty thousand houses were destroyed immediately. One concrete structure remained standing, although it was damaged. The local government left the atomic dome standing as a memorial to the explosion. Even those who were not seriously injured in the explosion later became very ill. They became very sick from radiation poisoning. Many developed leukemia. Sadako Sasaki was two years old when the bomb exploded. She was apparently uninjured and grew up normally until she was twelve. Then she developed leukemia, a disease of the blood and bone marrow. Sadako began to fold paper cranes to protect her from the illness. However, she died in 1955 before she reached 1,000 paper cranes. Her example inspired the Children's Monument at Hiroshima. There is a peace museum in Hiroshima which has objects left by the explosion. These include bottles, metal, stones, and tiles twisted into strange shapes by the heat. There are objects on which people were vaporized so that their shape appears like a shadow on the material. There are bits of burnt clothing and many photographs. Why was the bomb dropped? World War II was a long and bitter war. The rules of war, which said not to kill civilians, were forgotten. Hitler bombed London, hoping to break the spirit of the English. Then England bombed Germany to destroy the factories and kill the people who worked in them. Americans wanted revenge for the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The U.S. government had spent six billion dollars developing the A bomb and wanted to use it. Some say that they also wanted to warn the Russians not to cause trouble for America. When American forces advanced on Japan in 1945, they had to decide what to do: would Japan surrender or would they fight to the last soldier? American leaders feared that they might lose many men by an invasion. Dropping the atomic bomb would end the war very quickly. President Truman made the decision to use it. Since then, most people have felt that this decision was wrong. It was such a terrible thing to do to people. Children, old people, women, men, and babies. Hiroshima inspired many people to try to ban the bomb. They wanted to ensure that atomic bombs would not be used again. Even some of the scientists and air crews involved in making and dropping the bomb at Hiroshima wanted it banned. Perhaps, if we can all remember what happened that day, there will be no more Hiroshimas. Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is one of the world's leading tourist attractions. Millions of people around the world visit here each year. Summers at the falls are especially busy with traffic jams and parking problems. However, the falls are beautiful in winter too. Many have asked why people travel so far to see water falling over a cliff. The size and beauty of Niagara Falls help to make it special. While many falls are higher than Niagara, very few are as wide or have such a volume of water. It also helps that Niagara is relatively easy to travel to. When the first Europeans came to Niagara, the falls were surrounded by forest. The noise of the falls could be heard miles away before they were actually seen. The first visitors were filled with horror at the sight. Later, fear ceased to be the main emotion inspired by the falls. Later, visitors were impressed by the beauty and grandeur of the falls, which overwhelmed them with wonder. By the 1830s, people were able to come to the falls by railway. As more and more people came, the tourist industry developed. Early tourism was not well regulated, and there were many complaints about cheats and swindles. Today, there are similar complaints about tourist junk and high prices. The majority of tourists stay on the Canadian side. There are two falls separated by an island. Since the Niagara River forms the boundary here between Canada and the United States, each country has one of the falls. The Canadian Horseshoe Falls is wider and more impressive than the American Rainbow Falls. About nine times more water goes over the Canadian falls.
Nonetheless, there is much to be seen on the American side. The island in the middle, Goat Island, is one of the best places to view the falls and rapids. It is on the American side. Newly married couples began coming to Niagara Falls when it was still a secluded, peaceful, and romantic spot. It is still popular with newlyweds as a relatively inexpensive and convenient place to spend their honeymoon. Besides being beautiful, Niagara Falls is also very useful. Their falling water is the power behind several of the largest hydroelectric stations in the world. Much of the electric power used in this part of North America comes from Niagara Falls. In order to harness this power, half of the flow of water is channeled away from the falls during the night and during the non-tourist season. Probably most visitors don't notice the difference. Niagara has attracted many kinds of people over the years. Businessmen have come to profit from the tourists. Daredevils have come to make a name for themselves. Some have gone over the falls in a barrel, while others have walked above the falls on a tightrope. Poets and artists have visited here to capture its beauty. Lovers have come to gaze on its romantic scenery. All of these and many others have helped to make Niagara Falls world famous.